The life story of Maurice Connor reads more like fiction, but it's a life that's been built on hope, courage, faith, strength of character, and the will to succeed despite tremendous odds. Such is the inner fate of this man that the fact of being blind and having to catch three taxis every day does not faze him. Well, by and large, eh, John Q. Public is, is very helpful to us when we walk about as blind, you know. They, <clears throat> they help you cross the streets, especially the busy intersections. When it's fairly quiet, you wait and you listen and you cross. Or if, if, you, if you're at the corner and it's a traffic light, or you can use your um, judgment and you know, while the traffic's going the other way, so it's pretty safe to to cross, but downtown and, and, and Independence Square and so on, people usually come up, you know. They might greet you in different ways, but uh, they, they, they do help. I mean, come, I have come to be known as dads, pops, brother man, uh, papi. Music, <laughs> music man. Piano man. Piano man. Uh. Hey, piano man, where are you going? <laughs> you know, and things like that, you know. But they are helpful, so it makes life a little easier. Uh. But it has never been easy for Maurice Connor. He has had to learn to cope with all sorts of situations, especially those persons who display a condescending attitude toward the blind person. When you're young and progressive, um, a lot of that tends to annoy you a good deal. Depends on your own personality too, I expect. But um, you have to take each situation on its merit. Eh? Sometimes I just let it ride or make a quiet protest or just don't take on type of thing, you know. It depends on you and it depends on the situation, where you are and just how you want to deal with it. It, it, it really doesn't affect me to any great degree anymore. Not that I would lie down and let Tom Jones or Mary Jane walk on top of me. Assertiveness for sure. Indeed, Maurice Connor feels strongly that the blind person, except for the fact of being sightless, is on par with anyone else. Well, as any normal human being. You know. No special favors? Uh, no special favors. I mean, you, it, uh, there are practical considerations. If, if you know he's going to run into a door, you, and you could help it, you would say, look out, you're going towards a door or something. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't, um, you know, that, that type of thing, if you know he's... There's a crossing coming up, uh, a, a little canal, as we call it. You won't s deliberately stand by and watch and let him or her fall into it. Yeah. But a lot of people get so excited, they make you look so excited. Take care, take care, take care. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> you know, <laughs> instead of just, you know, simply saying, be careful, you're coming to a, a canal yes. type of thing. Yeah. Practical things like that where you do need some assistance, but. Um, I mean, generally speaking, you know, it's, it's a normal case. Have you personally ever experienced any such situation? But you mean of... of, of well, it's coming up against an obstacle oh, and somebody yeah, excited. I you. mean, definitely. <laughs> you know, when you're walking around town and you're, you're crossing a street, you have, you have heard the car coming, you know, and mm -hmm. you haven't even stepped off the pavement. Yes. Don't go, don't go, don't go. Wait, wait, wait. I can't come in. <laughs> Oh, yes, uh, that, that happens a lot of times. Oh, that's, uh, I mean, it, it wouldn't be part of the thing. Yes. <laughs> you get some interesting happenings. Some people feel you should be out after six. I don't even consider him disabled. I really don't even think of him as a blind person. Um, it hasn't bothered us at all in our music because you can get classical music in Braille, so if it is necessary, I will get it in Braille. And apart from that, I really don't think, I don't consider it. I never think of him as being blind because I don't think he thinks of himself as being blind. I have to say that it has made no difference. Of course, the first time you meet a blind person, you, you are attracted to the fact that they are blind. But very soon after that, because Morris held his own, that he was so accomplished in his field, so confident, you know, you never remembered that Morris was blind. And, and I remember many years ago when I was a teenager, going down to do a recording for the government broadcasting unit and leading Morris along that street. And I really, I knew he was holding me, but that's all. And the uh, next thing I heard, book, Morris had hit his head on the ledge, you know, of the roof of something, because I didn't remember that Morris was blind. And you don't think of his disability, because he's so confident in his own ways, you know.
Doing it his own way bespeaks a certain perception of life, and in his case, one unfettered by thoughts of his infirmity. In fact, he does not see his infirmity as a handicap. Well, what is a handicap? That's a good question. Eh? I, I know at times it can be a, it can be a bit of a nuisance. I, uh, I'll have to agree with that, yes. But um, it's never really been a... I've never made it a federal case, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but it, it, it can be a bit of a nuisance, that's, that's true, yes. When you want something and perhaps you don't know where it is, you know, things like that. Comparatively minor details. This positive way of thinking had obviously been a part of Maurice's personality from early. As he tells it, he had to cope with his blindness when he attended high school in Canada. There, at Queen Elizabeth High, he and another boy were the only blind students among hundreds of sighted students. Well, we, I had, we had completed grade 11 at the Halifax School for the Blind, working at a normal pace, right? No, no kind of slowing down for us. We were doing grade 11. And they used, before I went there, do it in two years. This year, well, they decided they're going to do it in one. So we took it up. In other words, we were working at the pace of a normal sighted student. Mm -hmm. So that when we went out to grade 12, it wasn't all that uh, difficult to adjust. We had to get the texts in Braille and things like that, but, well, that's all part of the, you know, it's all part of the thing if you're going out. Yeah. Yes. So I, I didn't really find it all that Difficult. It, it, it had its problems in that sometimes you'd get a, uh, your books a little late, but then of course it's up to you to read up. You know. Yeah. So in other words, you got no special consideration for that. School. Oh no 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 no. You you were expected to bring in your anybody else. Essays on time and do your work. It, uh, your, there's no special concession for you. The only thing they might have given you was extra time during your examination. Uh -huh because of the Braille business where you had to transfer, you know, your fingers to the page and turn a page and find a page, etc. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> in that year, we, we, we dealt with it in time. I guess our reading fluency was up to, up to scratch and we didn't require any additional time. Maurice had, before this, spent time at the School for the Blind in Halifax. He subsequently graduated from Dalhousie University in 1951 with a BA degree in history and political science. Maurice Connor was born in Barbados. He was brought to Trinidad at the tender age of six to attend the Institute for the Blind, where he eventually received his elementary education. It was at this institute, of which he is now the acting principal, that his life's journey began. Here he was to start his musical career. And here, too, he would meet his now adopted mother, Inez Nelson, the then matron of the Institute, who he acknowledges has been the greatest influence in his life. Oh, a great deal, really, you yeah, because there was no school in Barbados, and mommy, uh, and, uh, in fact, both parents were very anxious that I should get some education. So they got in touch with Audrey Jeffers, uh, who was at that time doing a lot of work for the blind, uh, as part of her coterie workers, coterie of social workers thing. And uh, she put them on to the Institute for the Blind. Well, I came across the, to the Institute eventually in 1936. Well, Auntie, as we call her nowadays, um, came to be the matron in 1938. And she would insist that I must write my folks in Barbados every fortnight. <laughs> So you could imagine that being a bit of a chore. I was to write it in Braille and she would put it into print. Mm -hmm. And they began to correspond and they appreciated the fact that she was taking that interest. Eventually they met and, well, their relationship grew. And uh, when I left the Institute, I went to stay with her, you see, and her family. She has indeed had a profound influence on it. it in fact, it was through her initiative that I managed to get away at all to, to Canada. Yeah, she set the wheels in motion with the Guardian, the Guardian newspaper and so on, you know. 
Yeah, so really she has had a profound influence. She unfortunately isn't well these days, but well, we, you know, it's one of those paths along the way that remain indelibly imprinted. For her part, the life of Mrs. Nelson has also been enriched by the presence of Maurice. At age 89, she is firm in her recollection of the years and the bond that exists between them. And, uh, he has given me the satisfaction that I did not expect. Um, which makes our communication very simple with each other. It has indeed been a strong bond that has kept them close over the years. And as the story unfolds, Auntie, as Mrs. Nelson is fondly called, played a key role in Maurice's life by arranging for his education overseas, but only after she had given him a sense of direction and true purpose.